Ooh. Next on Even a Rope, we're in the films that made us roll our eyes and check our watches. We're ranking the worst films of 2005. Now picture that, but everywhere. That was a scene from Fantastic Four, and it kicks off our annual extravaganza of awful films. I'm Richard Roper. And I'm Roger Ebert, and Fantastic Four is 10th on my list. Just think, uh, there were nine films last year worse than Fantastic at Four. At least. A mysterious star storm invested human characters with superpowers. Mr. Fantastic has a body that can take any form. The thing is incredibly strong and stony. <laughs> Invisible Woman can generate force fields, her brother Johnny Storm can burn like a supernova, and all of them seem bored by the movie's plot. <laughs> that thing doesn't look so fantastic. Ben Grimm is a genuine American hero. What he means Please. is every team needs a mascot. <laughs> a new day is dawning. The day of the Fantastic Four. It is absolutely stupendously amazing that these people can do these stupendous, amazing things and yet they're incredibly casual about their powers. Johnny Storm, for example, could incinerate the earth itself, but he shows off by setting his thumb on fire like it's a cigar lighter. It's gotta ah, get better than that. You would think so. And you know what, Jessica Alba, if you're gonna put her in a film, she should be the visible girl, not invisible. She's Jessica Alba. My number 10 pick is The Legend of Zorro, which sucks all the charm, all the romance, and all the adventure out of the 1998 hit. Plus, it's really long. This time around, the aging Antonio Banderas plays the dark hero as kind of a town mascot. He's a cheerful swordsman who uses Three Stooges slapstick to defeat the cartoonish villain. <laughs> Worst of all, Banderas and Catherine Zeta-Jones have turned into a bickering sitcom couple who get divorced due to ludicrous contrivance of the screenplay. And it doesn't help that their son is a mini Zorro who has magically inherited his father's abilities but can't figure out that it's daddy behind that little mask. The first film was so good and now they're trying to remake Spy Kids. I don't understand it. <laughs> My number nine, Elektra, is another superhero movie. This one's starring Jennifer Garner as a killer for hire who has mastered all the martial arts but has not mastered her obsessive compulsive disorder. Hired to protect a young girl, she becomes the target of a secret group known as The Hand. <laughs> Number eight on my list, Undead, begins with a meteor shower that turns a small Australian town into zombies, which threaten the woman just crowned Miss Catch of the Day in the big fishing tournament. Escaping town with the Miss Catch of the Day runner-up, she encounters a guy who blasts flesh-eating zombies with three barrels at a time. And my number seven film, Constantine, star Keanu Reeves is a chain-smoking professional demon hunter who knows that some who walk among us are scavengers of the damned. Ah. He's dying of lung cancer and his job is to cast demons back down into hell. No wonder he looks so depressed so much of the time. <laughs> Rachel Wise is the L.A. cop whose sister may be a demon victim. <laughs> What's wrong? I don't know, I just feel... <laughs> The problem with all of these movies is that they've seen too many other movies. They're bored with themselves. They lack a sense of wonder. Mm. Everyone is so casual about the stupendous events surrounding them and the enormous powers at their command, and their challenges are so trivial. The thing about great superhero movies like Spider-Man 2 and Batman Begins is that they have the imagination to match the scope of their superpowers. Yeah, well, curses on you for reminding me of the undead. I had forgotten oh, yeah. about yeah. that movie. And Constantine, you know, Keanu Reeves has that thing where he's like, you know, oh, curse you, fair demons, mm -hmm. I'm going to get you. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. an awful performance. Lives over the bad bowling film. alley, yeah. Bad movies. I got some more bad ones for you. At number nine, I've got Bewitched. It's another one of those postmodern, self-referential TV to movie jobs that's not nearly as clever as it thinks it is. Nicole Kidman's Samantha is an empty-headed romantic who arrives in Southern California ready to fall for the first idiot she meets. But if you want a normal life, why would you fall for a preening actor and why would you become an actress yourself? This movie is so bad, it put a temporary stop to the Will Ferrell Comedy Express. 
Oh my God, where's my dog? We delve into remake territory once again with my number eight pick, Guess Who, with Ashton Kutcher and Bernie Mac taking over the roles made famous by Sidney Poitier and Spencer Tracy. An upgrade? You decide. Simon, Simon, I'm not joking. Stop it. Simon, Simon, take, take it, it off. off. You take it off. Come in. <laughs> At number seven, it's The Man, another movie trying and failing to squeeze laughs out of the badass black guy and the cowering white nerd. Samuel L. Jackson plays the rogue cop, and you better believe there's a scene where the lieutenant tells him to hand over his badge and his gun. Eugene Levy just phones it in as a dental supply salesman from Wisconsin. But if I hear the sound of your voice right now, I can't be responsible for my actions. So this would be a very good time for you to shut up! This is the kind of movie that you could watch on an airplane without bothering to put on the headphones and you'd still know what's happening and you'd still know it was terrible. I'd recommend watching it on an airplane without putting on the headphones or looking at the screen. <laughs> I still don't think it would be any good. Coming up next, an Oscar winner, a former professional wrestler and a creepy dancing baby all appear in some of the worst films of 2005. Richard and I are scraping the bottom of the barrel as we name the worst films of the year. Number six on my list is Doom. It takes place on the planet Mars, but you'd only know that from the opening shot. Everything else happens inside, where monsters spend most of their time attacking the characters and getting shot down, just as if this was a video game, which, you know, curiously enough, basically it is. We're in pursuit! There's no way to attack! Number five on my list, Son of the Mask. The magical mask from the first movie is found by a family dog who brings it home so that it can transform its owner, played by Jamie Kennedy, into a brilliant advertising man. He unwisely wears it to bed, fathering a super kid who, because he is still a baby, is more alarming than funny. Baby, my heart's on fire. If you refuse me, honey, you lose me. Then you'll be left alone, oh baby, telephone. And tell me I'm your own. Here I think they missed a bet. They have the god Odin and his son Loki fighting for control of the mask. And they focus on how the family dog develops the powers of a cartoon character. The first mask movie set us up for a lot more than that. I think it's pretty funny that you are focusing on this one plot point as if somehow Son of the Mask could have been a good movie if they had only done it that way. It didn't have it's to be terrible, this bad. Roger. It's it like didn't have to be this bad. It's like Dumb and Dumberer when they do the sequel and they can't even get the original actor, so you have these second rate guys trying to do it and it's just sad. Okay, at number six, talking about sad, we got Miss Congeniality 2, Armed and Fabulous with Sandra Bullock chomping up the scenery, doing a truly awful working class accent as FBI agent Gracie Hart. Every scene clunks and sputters to a laugh-free conclusion, but the worst spectacle of all is a stage number in Vegas. He's gonna give us the hook, sell it, Tina. Oh, I left a good job in the city, working for the man every night and day. Even less believable than Sandra Bullock as an FBI agent, Jessica Biel in my number five pick stealth playing a top level Navy officer and pilot who apparently has crammed about 10 years of training into six months given her age. In the funniest supposedly serious sequence of the year, Biel gives play-by-play -play commentary as she somehow survives an ejection that would kill Superman. Josh Lucas and Jamie Foxx are wasted as Beale's partners, but at least Foxx has the good sense to fly into a mountain so he can avoid the rest of the movie. And if you think I've spoiled the film by giving that away, hey, this show is called The Worst of 2005. We're trying to save you some DVD rental fees here. Yeah, I like the part where she's trying to get across the DMZ from North Korea to South Korea, yeah. and they're spotting one single person from the air in airplanes that are going, what, I don't know, 1,000 miles Eight an hour? Eight million miles Eight an hour, miles. I believe okay. they're going. That's the correct speed, okay. Thank you. We're getting closer to the top, or is that the bottom of our list as we work through the worst films of 2005? What do you think? Betty! I think that's a 10. Let's go with a 10. I'm sorry. I broke it in your toy. 
Roger and I are counting down the worst films of 2005. Coming in at number four on my list is The Longest Yard. <coughs> why, why, why did you give it a thumbs up? And why do a remake of the Burt Reynolds vehicle from 1974 with Adam Sandler? I heard you were dead. No, I ain't dead. I've been right here, rotting, waiting for a chance to get back at those sadistic guards. Waiting for this. You know, it's true I gave it a thumbs up, but if you read my review at RogerEber.com, you'll read one of the most tortured explanations for that <laughs> in history, and you can witness the sight of a critic's head exploding. Yeah, well, you know, I think I'd like to check that out. At number three, I wanted my head to explode as I sat through Monster-in-Law, a grotesquely unfunny comeback vehicle for Jane Fonda, who would have been better off doing another exercise video. In this loud, obnoxious, and desperate disaster, Fonda plays a deranged, insanely overprotective mother who flips out when her doctor son gets engaged. Oh, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> oh, my God, I can't believe this. I'm so happy for you. Congratulations. So pleased that you're going to be my daughter-in-law. Most of this movie involves Fonda and Jennifer Lopez trying to one-up each other in slapstick fashion. It's just humiliating for them. Jane Fonda waited a decade and a half to do movies just so she could splat face down in a plate of tripe. Help! Why Help. tripe? Why tripe, I wondered. Well, I, I mean, don't know. You don't want to, when you make a movie like Why this, tripe? you don't want to bring up the subject of tripe. You don't want to <laughs> introduce that topic. Maybe they were trying to tell into us Into the discussion. Number four on my list, Debs, D-E-B-S, <laughs> is, B-A-D, how you spell it, is about four <laughs> beautiful women who work for a secret agency specializing <laughs> in lying, cheating, what stealing, killing, and having their security compromised because of a lesbian subplot. Uh, At least happens. the lesbian material gives some of the characters individual attributes or otherwise they would be as interchangeable as a teenage mutant ninja turtle All Debs. Failed. In 2003, she went underground and has not been seen or heard from since. Yikes. That's not even the bad part. What's the bad part? No one has ever fought her. They live to tell about it. Oh. Number three on my list, Jenny McCarthy in the truly unbelievably tasteless and amateurish and unfunny Dirty Love in which a pretty girl debases herself after she gets hysterical when her boyfriend dumps her. Somebody should have realized it's not funny to see a nice girl like Jenny McCarthy humiliated for fun. The amazing thing is McCarthy wrote the screenplay herself. The longer I stand here, the more herbs gonna have to clean up. Well, that seems to be your problem, not mine. No. Herb, can we get a price check, please, on the supersized maxi pass for the woman who keeps bleeding all over the store? There are scenes in Dirty Love so tasteless I can't even describe them. No, honest, I can't. <laughs> I'm thinking of the pool on the oh, supermarket golly. floor. Yeah, that uh, one. The uh. movie is not merely bad; it's incompetent and embarrassing. And anyone in the audience, I'd say anyone, could make a better movie than that. Yeah, you know, and I like the fact that Jenny McCarthy wants to put herself yeah. out there, but she should have reined herself in when it comes to this thing. Coming up next, Richie and I both named the two worst films of 2005, and if you still think Daisy Dukes are in style, or you happen to be a gigolo, you may want to leave the room now. <laughs> Read Richard Roper at suntimes.com and Roger Ebert at rogerebert.com. Hello, I'm Orville Redenbacher from Valparaiso, Indiana. And this is four ounces of my Orville Redenbacher's gourmet popping corn. And this is four ounces of your ordinary popping corn. That's popping okay. But look at mine, it's blowing the top right off of the popper. My gourmet popping corn pops up lighter and fluffier than ordinary corn. It's better, too. Orville Redenbacher's Gourmet Popping Corn. Try it. Boys, this is my roommate, Annette. Annette, this is Bo and Luke. Nice to meet you, Bo and Luke. <laughs> Ma'am. Annette's from Australia. Oh, let's put another shrimp on the barbie. <laughs> yeah, but that's what they say there. Okay. Richard and I are almost done putting the worst films of 2005 out to pasture, or actually in the pasture, or in what you find in the pasture, or maybe that's what the worst films are. Now, <laughs> we've gone this entire show without duplicating any of the titles on our list, and then two terrible, terrible films have brought us together. Aww. My pick for the second worst film of 2005 is The Dukes of Hazard, and since a little bird told me it's number one on Richard's list, well, actually... Richard told me it was number one of this. What can I possibly say that Richard isn't already about to say? Only one thing. 
How could you possibly think the Dukes of Hazard was worse than Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo? Well, you know, I do think you're dead wrong about Deuce Bigelow. It's not the worst movie of the year. It's the second worst movie of the year. That scene in the restaurant with the woman with a hole in her neck, it's just nauseating. And how about Eddie Griffin's pimp, who's so homophobic, he'd rather be known as a serial killer than gay. And that's really some advanced comedy. Ranking at number one on my list of the worst films is indeed Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo, starring Rob Schneider as a professional fish tank cleaner who visits his buddy in Amsterdam and gets involved in a gang that is murdering male prostitutes. What an amusing inspiration for a comedy. Deuce goes on one date with a giantess who makes him wear diapers. Deucey, no! Baby, walk to mommy. Come, come. No, like baby! Baby, walk to mommy. Good baby. And another date with a woman who's had a laryngectomy and during dinner sprays wine all over him. Uh, have some wine. Oh, oh. What I wonder when I see movies like Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo, and Dirty Love is wasn't there anyone around to tell Rob Schneider or Jenny McCarthy that their screenplays were just simply not funny and were offensive and depressing and sad. A movie can be offensive and funny. There's something about Mary Prove that. But the key thing is the movie has to be funny. The next time either Schneider or McCarthy gets inspired to make a movie, they should simply make a documentary of the two of them having lunch together and discussing their plans. It might not be funny, but it would be more amazing than Fantastic Four. Well, how about this? We can make it the Fantastic Four. We'll join them for lunch, and they can tell us what they think of our criticisms of their movies. That, that might be would be a re reality well. TV show. I think they show, probably yeah. have a few things to oh, say to okay. us. Okay, my pick for the worst movie of 2005. Yep, it's The Dukes of Hazard. This is yet another warmed-over remake of a bad television show. When are the studio executives going to realize that randomly jamming your index finger in an old issue of TV Guide does not constitute creativity? Now, here's a scene from the original show. If Cooter's so tore up inside that he treats us like that, we couldn't have picked us a better time to come back to Hazard. Yeah, but what are you supposed to do for a man that's all full of pain? He won't even tell you where it hurts. Look See that? Systems, it guess. was a bad show. There's no reason Let's to turn it into a movie. Johnny Knoxville and Sean William Scott play Bo and Luke Duke, not as good old boys, but as leering sociopaths who really should be in jail. <laughs> And with her big head, big hair, big teeth, and big permatan, Jessica Simpson is like a human Barbie doll. But you know what? Your daughter's Barbie, even though it's a doll, probably has a more natural facial expression than Simpson. It looks like it's almost painful for this woman to speak. I know it's painful for me to listen to her. Now, the funny thing is there was a lot of publicity about whether Simpson or Britney Spears would get the Daisy Duke role as if this was some kind of plum part. It's not. And yet Simpson isn't even that sexy playing a jiggly bombshell. And or Burt Reynolds, who was also propped up and dusted off for the longest yard, looks like the Wax Museum version of himself in the Boss Hog role. Also, you get a nearly mummified Willie Nelson showing up. You could almost hear him thinking, when do I get my paycheck? Of all the bad film versions of TV shows, from the Flintstones to the Honeymooners, which one person I know actually liked, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this was one of the most painful to endure. I know you would probably disagree with me about this, but if they had to put somebody in there playing Daisy Dukes, how about Brittany Murphy, who is not only sexy, but actually funny? And kind of, you know, has a kind of a crazy edge to her, yeah, which she, makes her she interesting. Has, she would have had a little something, not that it would I have gotta tell you, though, really I, you helped know, the movie. I don't know. Meryl Streep could have played Daisy Duke, uh, and it wouldn't have worked. That would have been an interesting film. We'll be <laughs> back to recap our complete list of the worst films of 2005 right after this. Okay, recapping our lists of the worst films of 2005. My list, number 10, The Legend of Zorro. Number 9, Bewitched. Number 8, Guess Who? Number 7, The Man. At number 6, Miss Congeniality 2. At 5, Stealth. At 4, The Longest Yard. Number 3, Monster-in-Law. Number 2, Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo. And at number 1, or I guess number 437, if you're going the other way, The Dukes of Hazard. Okay, my list, number 10, Fantastic Four, number 9, Electra, number 8, Undead, number 7, Constantine, number 6, Doom, number 5, Son of the Mask, number 4, Debs, number 3, Dirty Love, 
Number two, Dukes of Hazard, and my pick for the worst film of 2005, and why stop there? There's a whole decade to think about. Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo. Oh, You're wow, good. wow. Those are, uh, those are some beauties. Yeah, those are movies to keep in mind the next time somebody says, gee, you have a great job. Exactly. We'll just present the list to them. We'll be back next week with reviews of new movies. Until then, the balcony is closed.